I want to welcome everyone today. And it looks like we're going to have a wonderful discussion with our own Dr. Shmuel Ravid. Um, and I'd like to just remind everyone that we will be recording this and we will also be encouraging uh, comments from the audience um, for a question and answer after the presentation that you can type questions in the Q&A and Dr. Lee Lewis and myself will help to moderate. So it, it looks like we have um, a large group today, which is really exciting for us. Um, Dr. Lewis and I have enjoyed um, moderating these over the last six months, and it is so fun for us to have Dr. Ravid joining today to be discussing palpitations. So before we jump into the medical aspect of the lecture, I thought it would be nice for us to just hear from Dr. Ravid and kind of get a sense of his background and his practice. So he trained initially in internal medicine and cardiology in Israel, and then came to Boston and trained again in cardiology as well as electrophysiology at the Brigham and also received his MPH. So has a number of impressive credentials. So it's, it's my honor to welcome him today. Um, Dr. Ravid, so fun to have you here. Maybe you would like to say hello, and then I would love to hear just how you happened to come to the Boston area from Israel. How did this journey begin? It's a long story. Thanks, Alison, for your kind presentation, and thanks everyone for joining us. So it's a long story. It started in Haifa, Israel, and we had an opportunity to come for postdoctoral fellowship in the US. My wife wanted to do her postdoc in the MIT, so we decided to come to Boston. And this was a number of years ago, and uh, we enjoyed every moment since then. The connection with the Lang Group was created by my chief at the time in in the Maimonides Hospital in Haifa, Israel, who trained in cardiology at the Brigham and trained with Dr. Laun. And when I told him that uh, we might want to come to Boston for further training, he created the connection. Uh, and here I am, a few days later. And how many years ago was this? Uh, this was actually on Halloween day, 1985. This was a nice coming to America on Halloween. Uh, I can only imagine, were you prepared? <laughs> no, <laughs> never seen it before. It was interesting experience. Um, well, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm glad it must have uh, been an okay first impression because you decided to stay. Yeah, uh, you're right. It was an interesting experience, as I said, you know, but we learned to enjoy Halloween subsequently. My kids, my family, everyone. <laughs> and it must have been wonderful to work with Dr. Lown. Um, you know, I know since I'm the newest physician to join the Lown Group, I've really enjoyed the, the commitment of everyone to this patient-centered practice. I don't know if you want to say a few words just about how it's been practicing in this environment and, and what led you here? Well, it's very interesting. Um, once we made the arrangement and to get to Boston and to join the Lown Group, uh, a couple of months later, Dr. Lown and his International Physician for Prevention of Nuclear War received the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, which initially I didn't make the connection, it was very interesting. But uh, the long grading of heart rhythm abnormalities in the mid 80s were, was already established and uh, internationally used. So I was familiar with the concept. I was interested in arrhythmias. So um, it was a nice experience to, to work with the person behind the name. 
a lot of stories and uh, a lot of insight into practicing cardiology and uh, actually the daily interaction with patients and the philosophy of to do for the patient and not to the patient was very good experience. Uh, and there's so much more that we, I think we could talk about there. I think obviously in these times of social unrest, being at an institution that has historically been committed to that bigger picture too, I think is probably important just to say out loud because I think um, we've all really benefited this past six months with so much uncertainty to really be tethered to the Lown Group and the organization really committed to its mission for caring for each other. Absolutely. Couldn't be stayed better, better I mean. Uh, and, and so much of our lifestyle, I think, has direct implications to the topic that we're gonna be talking about today. So I am uh, excited to kind of weave in all these pearls of wisdom that you're going to, to feed us about how we live and, and how this affects our heart. So is, is this maybe a good time for us to get started? I think so. Yeah, it's about time. So uh, welcome again to everyone. Uh, what I'm gonna do uh, is, uh, next slide please. Uh, I outlined the aims of the presentation in this slide. It's basically to discuss what are palpitations, to review the causes of palpitations, to outline what are the best treatments, and uh, then to take any questions that you might have. Uh, before we start, uh, next, okay, before we start, um, just a question to everyone. If you have, if you are willing to, uh, feel free to share in the chat box, which is optional, obviously. If you personally experienced palpitation, and if you did, can you describe it just in few words? And we'll get back to that later, um, after the next couple of slides. So let's go to palpitations and start with uh, Marion Webster definition, which is to beat rapidly and strongly and the synonym is throb. Uh, but palpitations uh, is a very, very subjective experience. And everyone, a lot of patients has, have a different um, description. I put here a few of the terminologies it used, like heart racing, forceful heartbeat, funny chest sensation, irregular heartbeat, skip beats, fluttering sensation, chest pounding, flip flopping, and you name it. There are so many more of them. And um, maybe at this point, Dr. Lewis, it's a good time to see how many of your patients actually said that they experienced palpitations and if they used any term specific terminology. Yep. So People are just starting to put some in, so we'll give them a few more minutes, but we're seeing some skipping, some fluttering, um, and, and other people that are looking for more guidance about what exactly you're asking, so. Okay, maybe we'll get back to, we'll go back at the end of the presentation. So we can move to the next slide. So palpitations are one of the most common symptoms that patients present with, especially to a cardiology practice. They, um, they are very common, they are basically universal, and they are present at all ages and groups and ethnicities. We actually have a large group of college students because of the sport programs that Dr. Bilchek uh, established. And you see that even in young, healthy people, palpitations are a major presentation for which we they, uh, request cardiology consult. And we see also a lot of foreign students. And again, regardless whether they're from Asia or Africa or Europe, palpitation is very common. The main uh, perspectives that patients have about palpitations that it's intuitively connected to the heart and creates a lot of anxiety uh, because it's the heart. And that's the reason many of them are seeking uh, 
uh, medical advice. Palpitations are frequently uh, go together, but they are not synonym with arrhythmia. Arrhythmia, again, this is the dictionary definition of arrhythmia, is an alternation in the rhythm of the heartbeat, either in timing, rate, or force. You know, force may be pounding, timing may be irregular, uh, but the most common cause of palpitation are arrhythmias. Um, other uh, causes are psychological causes. I think actually going back to the, to the first one, in large studies done in Europe many years ago, about 45% of patients who complained about palpitation suffered from some type of arrhythmia and about 30% had psychological causes, whether it's emotional stress, anxiety, panic, which are very common, especially during COVID, obviously. There are a lot of physiological reasons for palpitations. Pregnancy is one of them, anemia, low blood count is another of them, physical stress, emotional stress, dehydration, low blood pressure, but there are also uh, actually metabolic abnormalities. The most common one is hyperactivity of the thyroid gland, low blood count, anemia, infections, and so forth. Many medications can cause palpitations. The most common one are inhalers for asthma because they, are, they activate or they trigger the adrenergic system. Medications that young people especially use all the eight, uh, ADHD medications, the amphetamines, and other stimulants cause palpitations. Diuretics, water pills that we use in our practice for high blood pressure uh, create uh, um, occasionally uh, depletion of potassium, which is also a cause of palpitation, as well as magnesium depletion. Most commonly, stimulants that we use on a daily basis, whether it's caffeine, alcohol, smoking, illicit drugs that some people use, prescription drugs like amphetamine, and uh, uh, have the side effects of palpitation quite frequently. How do we approach palpitations? Uh, the one thing that I want you to remember, the one take home message from this uh, presentation, is that palpitations are most commonly benign, are not related to significant heart condition, but in rare cases, they can represent a serious heart condition and therefore require some workup to rule out cardiac conditions that might be life threatening. And the Every patient that complain of palpitations, uh, we uh, recommend initial basic evaluation. And this includes, you know, taking the history at what circumstances do you have palpitation? Is it like I have now during public speaking? Is it when you exercise? Is it when you wake up from sleep, from sound sleep, and your heart is, is racing because of a nightmare? Uh, other stresses, and this is very important to provide a clue to the cure. If it's triggered by excessive coffee or excessive alcohol, you know what is the solution. Not easy to follow and do it, but it gives us clue about it. And uh, the physical exams that we do as part of the evaluation is to identify obvious causes. If a patient presents to the office with an obvious arrhythmia, if a patient is in heart failure or if they have obvious findings of a metabolic abnormality like the eyes are bulging because hyperactivity of the thyroid gland, it directs you towards the cause. We do an ECG, which is measure, uh, tracing of electrical activity of the heart. It tells us whether the patient is in, in normal rhythm, whether they have an arrhythmia, and more importantly, whether they have an arrhythmia predisposition, which is important to rule out serious, potentially life-threatening arrhythmias. As many of you know, we do the echocardiogram, the ultrasound, which gives us a clue about structural abnormalities that can predispose to arrhythmias like cardiomyopathies, abnormal heart muscle, 
prior heart attacks, etc. And then in many cases, we do also the cardiac monitoring. Used to be a Holter monitor for 24 hours. With more digital sophisticated technologies, we can do real-time monitoring over time, like some of you uh, did have for several weeks, which gives us a better idea about the nature of the arrhythmia and the circumstances when they occur. Some names for arrhythmias that you heard before. So uh, this is <clears throat> just for the general knowledge. This is, uh, uh, you know, a picture of the heart, which is uh, generally divided to the upper chamber, the atria, and the lower chamber, the ventricles, left ventricle, right ventricle. And the uh, arrhythmias can originate either in the upper chamber, atrial arrhythmias, or in the ventricle, the ventricular arrhythmias. We all have a normal pace, an in native pacemaker called the sinus node, which is located where I'm showing right now. And any, any rhythm abnormality related to the sinus is uh, uh, is called sinus rhythm. The most common arrhythmia that related to the sinus is sinus tachycardia, which means normal rhythm, but faster than usual, originating in the normal sinus node. And this is the most uh, typically, which is related to excitement, to anxiety, to physical activity. When we run, when we climb upstairs, heart rate goes up, and if it's about 100 beats per minute, we call it sinus tachycardia. But as long as we use the terminology sinus, it means that it's an underlying normal rhythm. We have atrial and ventricular premature beats, PVCs or VPDBs, APCs or PACs. Uh, there are single beats originating either in the atria or in the ventricle. These are very benign arrhythmias, but that's when if someone may feel a flip-flop or a jolt in the chest. And then we have the sustained arrhythmias, either from the upper chamber, the supraventricular arrhythmias, from the ventricular uh, chambers, the ventricular tachycardia, which is the most alarming and uh, serious arrhythmia. And then a very common arrhythmia that we hear about all the time on TV commercials. And uh, this is the atrial fibrillation, which is the co most common arrhythmias, sustained arrhythmias that we see in the uh, adult population. And many of our patients have atrial fibrillation. Treatments. Uh, there are several categories of treatments and the most common one and the most effective one is reassurance. If we did the workup and we didn't find any predisposing cardiac abnormality and only benign arrhythmia, just alleviating the anxiety of the patients is, uh, provides the cure in the majority of patients. Not being concerned or preoccupied about the potential risk of heart attacks or, or heart failure because of the arrhythmia alleviates the symptoms in the majority of patients. Obviously, if we find that there is underlying heart disease predisposing to the arrhythmia, uh, then we need to treat it and depends on what we find. Uh, lifestyle modification or changes are mandatory. Um, if we identify an obvious trigger, whether it's a substance, whether it's an activity, uh, we try to eliminate it if it's stress you know, relaxation techniques and identifying how to respond to stress is important. Physical conditioning is very important, like in any case of a heart condition, because if we are out of shape, any minor activity climbing one flight of stairs will result in a rapid heartbeat and a sensation of palpitation. So being in good shape is very helpful. We have also some medications that we use. There are two main categories, one are the beta blockers. These are medications that blocks the effect of adrenaline. We use them for various heart conditions for high blood pressure, like metoprolol, etanolol, propranolol, and they slow the heart rate. Sometimes we use them even in advance, prophylactically. If you are gonna give a 
public talk and you are concerned about palpitations, you can take it in advance. They have some potential side effects, but if someone is very troubled by palpitations and we feel that we need to treat them, beta blockers are uh, a very uh, good options. Now we treat palpitations if they are not life-threatening, only if they affect the quality of life of patients. So if the quality of life is not affected and the patient does not have, does not have significant underlying heart disease, there is no need to treat. But if someone tells you that they are troubled by flip-flopping and fluttering that affects their ability to function, then beta blockers are a good choice. There's another group of medications that we can use for uh, benign arrhythmias, even for more uh, serious arrhythmias. Those are antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, some of you heard about amiodarone, flecainide, propafenone. We use it in practice. But these are medications that potentially have significant side effects. So we use it only when it's necessary to treat patients. And uh, uh, we use it, we tailor it to the right person, to the right patient with the right rhythm abnormality. In rare cases, we need to go and to proceed um, Sorry about that. We need to proceed with cardiac procedures like ablations, like cardioversions that we use for atrial fibrillation. But this is only as last resort, especially ablation, because like any invasive cardiac procedure, it might be associated with complications. And we always like to minimize the risk of complications by using invasive procedures only as a last resort. But some patients definitely need it and benefit from that. Uh, in summary, palpitations are very common. Generally, they are due to normal physiologic responses or to benign rhythm abnormalities. However, they need to be evaluated because of to rule out potentially serious conditions, lifestyle, uh, modifications are central to uh, management this type of symptoms of palpitations, especially eliminating uh, stimulants and triggers of arrhythmias and palpitations. I'll uh, finish at this point and open it for discussion and questions. Well, that was a lovely overview. Thank you, Dr. Ravid. Um, I was able to tally what patients and participants have entered in, and we had almost a third of the audience respond. And I just want to read what um, people typed in as their description of palpitations. Uh, fluttering, feeling like a bird in a cage, irregular beats, forceful and rapid beats, racing, especially when I'm asleep, often symptoms at night, heart skips, anxiety, rapid flutter, and pounding sensations. So that list looks very similar to the list that you put up. And I feel the tone when everyone was entering these were feeling that anxiety that these symptoms are very disturbing. And I think that's why patients usually get referred to a cardiologist to try to tease out whether some of these symptoms are really a benign etiology or if there's something more serious going on. Any, any thoughts on kind of that bird's eye view? You're asking me? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good bird's eye view. I think the anxiety is the most common symptom that brings patients to medical attention. Uh, the uncertainty. Uncertainty is the most difficult uh, sensation that, to deal with. And uh, because it's associated with the heart, it definitely triggers uncertainty and anxiety and alleviation of those anxieties or treating as needed uh, is uh, very helpful to patients. But anxiety is definitely uh, a major, major uh, symptoms for patients with palpitations. And Dr. Lewis, you want to jump in? Thank you. No, I wanted to say that I think, like many things in medicine, 
a symptom can sometimes be an indication of something terribly dangerous and potentially life-threatening, or it can be kind of background noise that is completely not worrisome. And as you pointed out, with palpitations, so often it's benign, but that small percentage of people do have something worrisome, which is why, of course, it makes patients feel anxious, it makes their family members feel anxious, it makes their primary care doctor feel anxious because they need to rule out those dangerous things. So even if the palpitation itself isn't all that disruptive to life, it's that possibility that it's heralding something worrisome. And I think for a lot of people in the chat mentioned atrial fibrillation, and a lot of our patients certainly have atrial fibrillation. Can you explain to us why atrial fibrillation of all these types of palpitations is really one that we need to pay a lot of attention to? Why is that different? Um, sure, thanks. Excellent question. Atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained arrhythmia in clinical practice. And once we get older, uh, it becoming more frequent in the population. Patients without heart disease in their 70s, about 5 to 10% will experience atrial fibrillation. And in the 80s, um, in, in the teens percent. The concern about atrial fibrillation, the major concern, it predisposes patients to stroke because of blood clots form in the upper chamber of the heart. I'll go to that slide back, show it to you. Um, this is the left atrium, the upper chamber, which is usually basically a conduit for blood from the lungs into the left ventricle, which is the major pump. But both the atria and the ventricles I may, are made of millions and millions uh, muscle fibers. And in order for them to function efficiently as a pump, they have to contract at the same time. If for some, day, if for some reason they become asynchronous and they do not contract at the same time, the atria instead of pumping is suddenly like fluttering. And therefore there is stagnation of blood in the upper chamber which has also a third, another compartment called the atrial appendage. And the stagnation of blood in that uh, compartment uh, predisposes for formation of blood clots. And if uh, blood clots unfortunately start dislodges from the atria and the appendage into the left ventricle and then into the main artery to the aura, which leads to the brain, then we may experience a stroke which is the most ominous complication of, of, uh, of atrial fibrillation. And that's the reason we are very sensitive when patients complain about palpitations to rule out atrial fibrillation. Uh, it's different than sudden death. It's basically disability and, and loss of independence because strokes from atrial fibrillation because of the size of the clot formed in the atrium uh, is very big and can cause significant stroke and disability. Many of these patients, depends on the scoring systems that we assign to them, need to be on blood thinners. And you see the commercials on TV all the time for the Eliquis and the Zerelto of the world. Uh, which reduces the risk of stroke significantly, but you know, it's a double-edged sword and predisposes patients to the risk of bleeding because the nature of the beast is that you thin the blood and you take the risk of bleeding in order to prevent stroke. But this is the most common arrhythmia that we deal with in clinical cardiology practice. Um, and, you know, I just want to, you know, echo what you said that as we age, unfortunately, that risk of atrial fibrillation increases, but quite often so do benign palpitations. And that's why we really do take this really seriously. And when you're having these new symptoms, we definitely want to do testing to look and make sure you have a structurally normal heart. We don't think we're dealing with any blood flow or blockage issues or other reasons that you're having these symptoms. And then uh, also exclude atrial fibrillation, which is that arrhythmia that really changes our management. 
quite often these symptoms that patients have are very disconcerting and anxiety provoking. And at the end of the workup, we say everything looks good, right? Or we find really benign reasons um, uh, for their symptoms. So maybe you should walk us through just, you know, someone coming to you for an evaluation and how you approach this and what, you know, you say to them uh, at each step of the testing. Okay, I'll go back to the slide of the initial evaluation. So we spoke about the circumstances. When do you get the palpitations, which is important. If it's during exercise, it might be related to some burden on the heart. Symptoms are extremely important. The most uh, significant symptoms related to palpitation is severe lightheadedness or even fainting spells, which prompts a very urgent and aggressive evaluation of palpitations because frequently it might represent a serious heart condition and uh, significant uh, drop in cardiac output in blood flow to the brain, which is the cause of fainting spells. Triggers we discussed, it's very important, and we go over a long list with, of potential triggers with patients uh, of uh, palpitations. And this is the most effective uh, potential cure for palpitations if patients can identify the trigger. Family history is extremely important because if you have family history of arrhythmias, if you had an uncle that died suddenly out of the blue, presumably of a cardiac arrhythmia, uh, it makes us more uh, alert and aggressive in evaluation versus someone that has no family history of heart disease or rhythm abnormalities. The ECG, as I mentioned, gives us, gives us a very good clue about the nature of the arrhythmia. We do ECGs on almost every one that we see. It's an excellent screening test. It gives us a lot of information, but it's a very non-specific test. ECG may be completely normal with a patient with significant heart disease, can be very abnormal sometimes as a normal variant in someone without heart disease. The ultrasound helps us to identify patients with uh, with structural heart disease. If someone suffered a heart attack and they are predisposed to ventricular tachycardia uh, in young people that come in because of various symptoms and we find an hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, so, which is a genetic form of thick heart muscle and predisposes uh, patients, primarily athletes, to sudden cardiac death. It's very easily identified by the, by the echocardiogram and frequently also by the ECG. The, if the echocardiogram is perfectly normal, it's very reassuring, but it's not a, a complete uh, um, clearance because some of the arrhythmias, the life-threatening arrhythmias, are electrical anomalies. So we don't see structural anomalies. It's uh, electrical activation, abnormal activation of the heart that can predispose to life-threatening arrhythmias. And uh, we do the monitoring. In many patients, we do also an exercise stress test. But if we think that patients uh, really have potentially life-threatening arrhythmias, uh, we'll proceed also with what is called an EP or an electrophysiology study in which we place catheters in the heart and try to stimulate and trigger various arrhythmias and measure various sec, uh, part of the heart for abnormal electrical activation and arrhythmias and potential for arrhythmias uh, in order to identify exactly the nature of the arrhythmias that patients suffer from. I must emphasize, however, that in the majority of patients, uh, we finish our evaluation and can reassure the patients after taking the history, doing the physical ECG and echo, and sometimes the monitoring. So it may sound ominous because some arrhythmias are very frightening, but in the majority of the majority of patients, we are dealing with a benign condition. 
Uh, wonderful. That adds a lot of clarity. Um, we're getting a, a lot of specific questions. And so I'm going to just read you a few of them because I think um, some of these probably have application to most of the listeners. Um, there are a number of questions about atrial fibrillation, risks of that, and, and someone also wants to know the difference between atrial fibrillation and flutter. Maybe just, again, summarize that for us. Sure. Um, let's start with the second part, flutter front relation. They are pretty much first cousins, but the mechanism is different. The fibrillation is typically uh, localized to the left atrium and the flutter to the right atrium or to the tricuspid valve, if I'll go back to my picture. Flutter typically originates around here and fibrillation around here in the left atrium. But what we learned is that eliminating ablation of flutter, which is relatively easy, will expose that in many patients they have also atrial fibrillation. So once we fix the flutter, we cure it, they come back with atrial fibrillation. Uh, in the past, we used to, uh, there was a concept that flutter is not associated with risk of blood clots and strokes because the atria is contracting very fast, but, in con but it's contracting in contrast to the fibrillation. We now understand that flutter itself is also associated with the risk of stroke especially in patients that can have flutter and fibrillation intermittently. So pretty much in terms of management and evaluation and to a certain degree treatment, uh, there is no uh, significant difference between um, I got the heart model. <laughs> Dr. Lewis Elfman brought the heart model. So this is the right side, the, um, and this is the tricuspid valve somewhere around here. Oh, I and think we what... can't see it in your window, just... Um... Oh, okay. Can you no, see? No, that's that? fine. Oh, there we go. Okay, I can push back. No, okay, I think we are set. So, um, that's fine. I think we are all set. You're out of the picture now, but let's go. Let's stick to the, uh, to the slide and that. So, um, as I said, uh, at the end of the day, the treatments, the evaluation, and the long-term outcome are very similar to the two, though mechanistically, initially, they are slightly different. Someone is trying to fix my camera. Okay. I think I'm okay now. Uh, the first question was about the predisposition to atrial fibrillation. Am I correct, Alison? The first yeah. part of the question. So the most common cause of atrial fibrillation is unfortunately aging. And there is not much we can do about that. But there are other factors that uh, play a role. Hypertension is the number one, elevated blood pressure. And in modern Western developed societies, uh, because of the type of nutrition, the type of stresses, the pollution and so forth, the majority of adult people will develop atrial fibrillation, it's, uh, hypertension, high blood pressure at some point in their life. So this is a major risk factor. Diabetes is a risk factor, uh, also associated with modern lifestyle, obesity, elevated blood pressure. Di um, alcoholism, and stimulants in general are a major trigger of atrial fibrillation, which is reversible. Uh, prior heart attacks, coronary disease, cardiomyopathies, everything which results in reduced function of the heart muscle and elevated pressure inside the lower chamber and the upper chamber of the heart also predisposes us for atrial fibrillation. In many patients, actually, uh, Dr. Lan used to term, uh, to term it as lone atrial fibrillation. We don't see a good, you know, we don't find a good cause of fibrillation. We know now that in many patients, there is also a genetic factors. There are young people that we identify with uh, 
mutations, genetic mutations that are associated also with cardiomyopathies and there is overlap between some of those genes. So if we see someone uh, with family history of atrial fibrillation in ya at younger age or atypical development of atrial fibrillation, sometimes we refer those people for genetic evaluation. Having discovered most of the common causes of the fibrillation. Yes, uh, absolutely. Hopefully. Absolutely. And I think that's why that preventative piece is so important with atrial fibrillation, because the so much of it is based on our, our lifestyle. Um, and we really have a lot of, um, of power to, to modify that risk. Um, so that's nice to, to hear the highlight. Um, when we're talking about palpitations, we commonly find um, not atrial fibrillation, but something called PVCs or premature ventricular contractions that really cause a lot of symptoms and a lot of emotional distress because people really don't feel well. Do you um, maybe want to walk us through what this definition entails and how, what your approach to that is? Yeah. Uh, Sydney, can you go to slide 15, please? So I'll, I'll try to explain to you in, uh, in a, in, in a semi-professional uh, terminology, what is a PVC and why it so, can be so frightening. So this is a ECG tracing and we see the first two bits that are very regular. The big spike is what we call the QRS, which represent the contraction of the heart muscle and the ejection of blood from the left ventricle or the right ventricle to the rest of the body and to the lungs. And it starts here and ends around here, what we call the T wave. During that period, there is ejection of blood from the heart. This is about third of the heart of the cycle. Two thirds of the cycle are basically filling of the heart with blood from the lungs and from the rest of the body. And during that time, the heart relaxes. A PVC occurs very early in the cycle. This is a PVC or a VPB. So there is very little time for the heart to fill with blood. And therefore the amount of blood ejected from the heart is very limited. And that's why we feel a skip. There is no pulse associated with that in many cases. However, because the next beat comes very late, due to electrical recovery, there is much more blood ejected from the heart with the next beat. And this feels like the jolt in the chest or the, uh, the flip-flop because there is more blood with the neck flip. PVCs are very common. And here is a slide uh, about PVCs. So you feel that the heart is beating hard, you feel breathing fast. Sometimes you, it's associated with dizziness and uh, pounding sensation because of the next beat being so strong. It's very common and the major, all of us, if I'll give to all of us a halter monitor for 48 hours, probably more than 85% will show some PVCs. In the majority of us, PVCs are entirely asymptomatic. We are not aware of it. Some of the patients are very sensitive, however, and they experience, they're very sensitive and they can feel every bit. And it's very disrupting and very anxiolytic, creates a lot of anxiety. But again, as for other palpitations in the vast majority, it's completely benign. And the moment you learn that it's benign and it's not associated with any with risk of heart attacks, et cetera, uh, you can be reassured. And I think that just highlights how important the workup is because sometimes um, symptoms are really disconcerting, but then when we're told that they're, they really are benign, it's much easier to ignore symptoms or just be able to live your life. Now, as part of that workup, you reference the Holter monitor, and we also do some more extended monitoring. And sometimes also people purchase monitors that they use at home. Do you wanna maybe just give us all an overview of what the options are for monitoring and what the doctor might choose? Sure, the old fashioned was a Holter monitor. 
if you look at the original Holter monitor, it was a big uh, communication device, military device uh, used, uh, I believe, initially during or after World War II. And it was like a big backpack uh, with a lot of antennas. The Holter monitors that we are familiar with was a box uh, tied uh, with a belt around the waist but was pretty heavy, it was a couple of pounds at least, and we monitored with an old-fashioned tape for about 24 hours. With modern digital, digital technology, everything changed. So we have obviously the Apple Watch, and the Apple Watch monitors the heart, and it's pretty accurate. It's not very good for atrial fibrillation because uh, of contacts in the algorithm, we have also the, the Cardia device that Dr. Lewis just gave to show everyone. And that's something that you can put on your telephone and monitor your heart rate when you feel palpitations. And we have also the monitors that we use, the mobile cardiac telemetry, which gives us the opportunity for us as doctors to monitor everyone in real time, to be the big brother in the cloud. So if a patient's called the office and said, I'm not feeling well right now, I can link to their device and see exactly what type of arrhythmia they have and to try to correlate symptoms and the ECG. But uh, this is one of the things that had a tremendous uh, progress or development in the past few years. And it's going to be even more uh, uh, common in coming years. So I think everyone, every patient, every human being will probably will be able to call his doctor and to tell them I am having atrial fibrillation now or palpitation with SVT. What should I do? Uh, this is a real revolution that we encountered in the last few years. And it's certainly great if we catch your symptoms when you're wearing the monitor, but the home devices for, for patients that really have sporadic symptoms um, give us the ability to capture it and see a tracing when they have symptoms. So the technology has really greatly aided us, I think, when we're talking about um, figuring out what the causes of the, of the symptoms. One of the things that patients with palpitations and arrhythmias as well we as doctors are aware of is what we call the day-to-day -day variability or month-to-month -month variability or sometimes year-to-year -year variability. You see patients with atrial fibrillation, for example, that will experience an episode once a year or two years, and then suddenly out of the blue, a storm of episodes over a short period of time, two weeks, and then it goes away. It's true very much for PVCs and PACs. And uh, because of that variability, monitoring for 24 hours, like we did with the halter, is not the most accurate way. And the monitors that we did now that can go uh, last for about a month at a time, especially for serious life-threatening arrhythmias, are very important when needed. And maybe just say a word how the Zio patch differs from the MOMI monitor that we commonly use. The Zio patch is a sophisticated, well, that will be my description, not sure that the company would agree with me, but it's a sophisticated long-term halter monitor. We cannot see what's going on in real time. You have to wear the Zio patch for a week, for two weeks, whatever, and then it has to be sent to the company for analysis and you get it two weeks later. I don't see it in real time. So if you have your symptoms today, and you have to wear the monitor, the patch for another two weeks, I'll have the results only two weeks from now, three weeks from now. With our monitors, the ones that we use real time, if you have a symptom right now and you call us, uh, we know we can take a look immediately online what's going on and uh, let you know what is the arrhythmia and what needs to be done. So I think Zio is um, a modern technology which is the patch, which is becoming obsolete right now. And I think the company itself is trying to, uh, to develop real-time patches that you can see uh, when patients complain of the arrhythmia, you can see exactly what is the nature of the problem 
rather than to wait a few weeks. And, and maybe just coming back, because we've kind of gone full circle about doing some detective work and monitoring and talking about um, evaluating symptoms to just hearing your strategy about, you know, if we've ruled out atrial fibrillation and it looks like you have a structurally normal heart, what, what are the lifestyle and supplement and medications that, that you typically recommend to your patients? Sure. Uh, as I said, lifestyle modification, especially if we are then if we are able to identify a trigger and eliminate the trigger, whether it's alcohol, whether it's coffee, whether it's amphetamines, is very useful. Sometimes uh, stresses are not easily eliminated. We cannot fire our employer or our children or whatever. We need to learn to live with that. And lifestyle uh, modification in terms of uh, stress management is very useful. Conditioning, exercise is very effective. Uh, but any type of relaxing technique, whether it's yoga, meditation, I think this was in my last slide, which I found the most effective way to control uh, stress related to medication is meditation, but it's very individual. For some people, just reassurance is good. For other people, even if they know that it's a benign arrhythmia, this is not sufficient, and then we have to go uh, to medications like beta blockers, or even in sometimes uh, intervention uh, to, to eliminate the arrhythmia altogether. Uh, because patients feel very uncomfortable having their arrhythmia. But in the majority, just reassurance and reassurance and more reassurance is extremely effective. I, I think that's great advice. And I think it's also really important to go into this with the mindset of being an investigator and, and be in detective mode because there usually is something that is triggering these and making that connection, whether it's, you know, having a glass of wine, having an extra cup of coffee, having a big meal, or as you pointed out, just being aware of the stress that, you know, we're all facing and understanding those triggers, I think are the first step to really um, feeling better. Um, I've also found that exercise really does help um, in patients that are sedentary. You're much more likely to have symptoms and regular exercise um, helps to moderate your blood pressure, um, helps to moderate hormones, um, and also can, can really have a positive uh, impact on uh, symptoms as well. So I'll just uh, put in a, a plug. Uh, yeah. Pain. Exercises also can be used as a diagnostic tool because arrhythmias related to underlying heart disease, structural abnormalities are triggered by exercise, vigorous exercise, while arrhythmias, benign arrhythmias, once you start to exercise, they are pretty much controlled and abolished. So if you want to, to examine yourself, climb up at two flights of stairs and see what happens to the extra bits. And you'll see that in most cases, they will disappear. And, and I think that's um, wonderful, you know, for us to, to just reiterate that why if you're having symptoms, you need the full workup, right? We can't just guess what's going on. We really need to evaluate and, and see what's, what's happening on a cellular level. Yes, Sarah. Dr. Lois. Um, I have a question. I have a lot of uh, women patients who, particularly at times where hormones are fluctuating, so puberty, pregnancy, and most often perimenopause, seem to have a flare in what had been a stable kind of background noise of PVCs or palpitations that suddenly becomes much more prominent, much more bothersome around these times. Can you explain what that's all about? I think you'll be better to explain it. But <laughs> we know that there is good correlation with hormonal changes, uh, perimenopausal period, pregnancy. Pregnancy is associated with palpitation primarily because of the increased blood volume and plasma volume and the sinus tachycardia associated with that. Um, perimenopausal uh, variation in arrhythmia is uh, 
obviously well known. I don't, I'm not sure that there is a good electrophysiological explanation to why that, but the autonomic nervous system is affected and this is the reason for hot flashes, changes in tone of blood vessel. This is the reason for night sweats, also changes in tone of sweat glands and blood vessels and so forth. So I assume it's the same mechanisms that changes the thresholds of electrical activities in, in, uh, in cells that uh, contribute to rhythm abnormalities. But exact mechanism, uh, I'm not sure that we understand. But clearly if someone uh, is perimenopausal um, and they experience more palpitations, it's probably part of the process, like any other perimenopausal or menopausal symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. The, another common cause um, that we see is dehydration. And certainly if you're severely dehydrated, right, you might end up in the emergency room. But sometimes we just don't hydrate adequately enough on a regular basis. Um, I don't know if you have found that too, Dr. Ravid, or? Oh, absolutely. This is a very important uh, uh, comment. I think I have it somewhere in my slides, but I forgot to mention it. Uh, it's very common to be volume depleted. And one of the body, the way physiologically we respond to volume depletion is accelerating the heart rate, especially if it affects our, also our blood pressure. In some of our patients, many actually, that we use diuretics, water pills to control blood pressure or to control fluid retention, uh, dehydration can be a factor. And also it associated with uh, depletion for set from certain electrolytes, potassium primarily, but also magnesium, uh, <clears throat> which uh, can predispose to various arrhythmias. Generally, you know, it's not listed in the textbook, but uh, for my patients with benign palpitation, I advise everyone, almost everyone, to try uh, over-the-counter magnesium supplements. It doesn't help everyone, but many benefit from that. And it's a very benign uh, supplement to try. So thanks for reminding me, but adequate hydration, especially when we exercise, especially during the summer, if, you, if we are out there journey, jogging, biking, playing golf, hydration is mandatory. And also staying away from those things that dehydrate us, um, and that's primarily coffee and alcohol. So if you know your yeah. triggers, especially on a hot day, you just want to be um, careful regarding that. Um, so here we are at the top of the hour. Um, this has been really fun and I think very informative for everyone. So Dr. Ravid, thank you so much for taking uh, time to share with us today. Thank you for inviting me and thanks for everyone that uh, tuned in. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. So it was nice to see everyone. Happy holidays, happy new year to everyone and we'll reconvene in, uh, in 2021. Take care, everyone.